Hi, everybody. Uh, before I start lecturing on regional wind systems, I would like to once more emphasize the significance of the semi-permanent high and low pressure systems um, of the world um, to the climates of the world. Well, we're not going to look at the whole world. We're going to look specifically at North America here. But make sure that you test yourselves on your understanding of the circulation here in these low pressure systems, the Aleutian low over here, the Icelandic low over here, that counterclockwise motion that is produced by the polar easterlies and the westerlies, that the convergence of those two wind belts uh, cause these low pressure systems. And then it's the westerlies and the northeast trade winds, the circulation of those two wind belts that produce these high pressure systems, both the Pacific high and in the wintertime, we call this the Azores high. But in July, that high pressure system moves back toward uh, North America and it's called the Bermuda high. Still, the circulation is the same caused by those two wind belts. And the other thing that I would emphasize. I talked about this previously, but how on the sinking side of high pressure systems, the air is descending, so it's warming up. Even if it has moisture in it, it will have a harder time condensing out because we don't have those cooling temperatures. Um, most of the world's great deserts are located on the sinking side of these high pressure systems. So the Mojave over here, let me get to my little um, laser pointer here. The Mojave, the Sonora Desert, the Chihuahua Desert here um, on the sinking side of the Pacific High and on the sinking side of the Bermuda High or the Azores High. Look what big dry desert we have here in northern Africa, the Sahara. So I hope that you're beginning to understand the relationship between the wind belts, the major wind belts, and the circulations and the role that they play in the climate that an area is going to experience. All right, well, let's talk about the regional wind systems then. Uh, there are a few here that I'll go over. They include the monsoons, the Santa Ana winds, the Diablo winds, which are kind of like the Santa Ana winds, but they impact Northern California, the Chinook winds, which you should already be familiar with, and our own local Delta breeze. So let's take a look at monsoons first. The monsoons are prevalent in India, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Northern Australia. Uh, these areas experience dry monsoons in the winter when there's a strong high pressure system that's built up over Central Asia. And the clockwise circulation in that high pressure system brings dry air to these regions. Remember, land will be colder than the water. Um, but there's a drastic change in the summer months. Now there's a high pressure system over the water, which is cooler than the land mass in the summertime. And the clockwise circulation brings moisture laden clouds to the adjacent land. The amount of moisture that is dumped in these areas can be phenomenal. Cherrapunji in India, which is in the foothills of the Himalayas, they get a boost from orographic uplift. They average 463 inches of rain a year with the greatest amount of that falling during the wet monsoon months. It is known as one of the wettest places in the world. It also has the greatest recorded single year rainfall of 1,042 inches between August of 1860 and July of 1861. And in July of 1861, they had the greatest one month total of 366 inches. That is the highest uh, amount of rainfall ever recorded falling in one month. So a very wet place. That's all you can say about that. So farming depends on the arrival of this moisture, but it can also result in damaging floods. So this shows you what's going on here. 
in the winter dry monsoon. It's very cold here over Central Asia. So high pressure means sinking air. That clockwise motion out of that high ends up bringing these dry winds into these regions. Now look what happens in the summer months, June, July. Now there's a higher pressure system located over the water and that clockwise motion now is moisture laden. So these winds come in, the moisture condenses out of them and that's the monsoon. And you can see here from this um, yearly precipitation graph, how there's very little rain that's falling in these months right here, the winter months, but look how those numbers shoot up in the summertime, June, July, August, and uh, into September. So seasonal reversal of the wind caused by these changes in air pressure. And this is a view of Thailand where, yes, it brings much needed water, but it can also result in destructive flooding. And in the southwestern part of the U.S., Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, portions of New Mexico, we get a summer monsoon too. Not as strong as the monsoon that hits in Southeast Asia, but they can get these very torrential rainstorms that will cause flooding. And it's because of um, the slow pressure that's built up over the desert that pulls in that counterclockwise motion in the low pressure pulls in moisture from the Gulf of California and even the Gulf of Mexico. And anytime you see pictures of the, of the flash flooding that is occurring in these regions, it's usually in the summer months and usually, usually the result of um, um, the monsoon. So let me see if I am able to show you all something. There we go. Several summers ago, I was in Las Vegas, New Mexico, not Las Vegas, Nevada, Las Vegas, New Mexico, and it was the height of the monsoon season dry as could be. It had been so hot. We landed in this little town staying in this great motel, or sorry, hotel, and the storm came up, and it was just torrential for a little while. I had to get out and take a video of it. Now, let me go back to my I'm slowly getting the hang of this. I'm sorry you all have to be the guinea pigs for all my mistakes, but it's the best I can do. My, my mouse won't work. I, there we go. So then there are the Santa Ana winds. They're strong dry winds that blow out of the high desert of Nevada, Utah, Arizona, toward the lower pressure um, off the California coast. Usually at their height in October and March, that's when they commonly occur. So the air is coming from these higher elevations to lower elevations, so you know what's going to happen. It adiabatically warms, and then it gets funneled through these steep mountain canyons, and it speeds up because it's being compressed into a more narrow area. So it speeds up. So we end up with these hot, dry winds blowing into these areas that are just tinder boxes anyway, uh, because of it being summer and it's fire season. And all it takes is one little spark and it turns into these conflagrations that can destroy, like we've seen so much of this happening in the past few years. Um, so they, they're very instrumental in fanning these wildfires. We in Northern California have our own version of the Santa Anas, and sometimes the Santa Anas can be felt as far up as, as uh, our region. But we have the Diablo winds here in Northern California. They're, they come from the north, 
So they come into the North Bay area. Remember the Santa Rosa fires a couple of years ago? Uh, that was the Diablo winds, the Oakland fire that happened, gosh, in the early 90s that burned, that roared through the Oakland hills, destroying everything in its path. That was, um, that was caused by the Diablo winds also. So they descend in through the North Bay hills and they dry out and they get faster as they're coming through those narrow passes uh, between the hills. So those are the Diablo winds. Uh, so this is just showing you how these hot, dry winds travel downhill and come out toward the coast. And this is a satellite view in 2017. If you remember the Tubbs fire and the Atlas fire, um, this is um, a satellite view of those. And you can see the direction. You can see how all the smoke is blowing out across the ocean. So that's the Santa Anas that are that are causing the the winds to blow like, or the fire, the smoke uh, to blow that way. And then this was October 2003 when Southern California was on fire big time. Uh, and again, you see all these fires and you see the direction that the wind is blowing the smoke. Then there are the Chinook winds, which you're already familiar with. Uh, they warm uh, as they flow down the leeward side of the mountains, they adiabatically warm and dry out. And sometimes these winds, especially in the, the cities that are in the foothills of the Rockies, like um, Boulder and Colorado Springs, Denver, sometimes you get wind speeds that reach up to 140 miles per hour. Those, those uh, speeds have been calculated, or sorry, have been clocked in Boulder, uh, that's like tornado strength, and it does damage like a tornado can do. Uh, so they also end up melting the snowpack because they're warm, and that can cause flooding. And here we go, there's our leeward side of the mountain, windward side adiabatically cooling, so condensation is going to happen uh, and we can get rainfall and snowfall. And that's not to say that it's never going to rain or snow on the leeward side of the mountain, because it does. It's just not as much as is going to happen on the windward side of the mountain, because we don't have that good mechanism. We have warming taking place instead of cooling. And then we already talked about spearfish and how the Chinooks gave them a world weather record. And then this is the Delta Breeze. This is our own little air conditioner in the summertime. When the valley is so hot, we get these over 100 degree temperatures and we just pine for the delta breeze to kick in. So it's a convection cell where in the valley because of all the heat, the air is rising and when it rises, it can pull in this cooler air and when the marine layer is thicker, that's when we have more of a chance for a delta breeze. Uh, so it pulls it through that opening in the delta. If the coast range was continuous, if we didn't have that gap, then we wouldn't get that effect. Uh, but we do have the gap, so the air comes through, and then it can go north and it can go south. So people as far away as Fresno can get maybe a, a temperature decrease uh, and maybe a, a degree or two, um, and all the way up toward Red Bluff too. But because we're closer to it, we get the, the most cooling effect and it and it's such a relief from the oppressive heat of the summertime. Then there are also uh, land breezes and sea breezes. During the day land heats up faster than water does so there will be a lower pressure system over land and again this is just a convection cell. The warm air rises, it cools, air flows from high to low so we end up with a sea breeze during the day, but at night that land cools down faster than the water does. So we get a high pressure system sitting over the land. And again, another convection cell, low pressure here, the air rises. And then if you're out here in a boat, then you're gonna be getting a breeze from the land. Here, you know, sea breezes are cooling effects. Anybody that's on the beach, sometimes you don't know how burned you're getting because you have that nice sea breeze blowing on your face. But then there's a switcheroo in the evening. 
All right, I'm going to stop there and get to atmosphere and ocean linkages next time in the next part of this lecture. So I hope you, I hope these are being helpful for you. Um, they take a lot of time and energy. Um, so if, if um, you know, if you think the PowerPoints without my narrating them, if you think those are just as good, I would really like to hear from you. Um, but I, I will probably be that situation where some people like it, some people don't, and I'll still have to continue doing these. I don't mind as long as they're helping you somewhat. Okay, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.